Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Um, I'm Ted Klastron. I'm the program chair for the uh, INFORMS conference. Thank you very much for uh, coming this morning to the tutorial on structural economic models. Uh, when we uh, first uh, started uh, planning the INFORMS conference uh, two years ago, this conference, one of the things that we wanted to do was to get some of the best plenary keynote and tutorials that are possible. And uh, thanks to Sergei Natesin, who is the tutorials chair, we have accomplished at least the third goal. So thank you, Sergei, who I know is not here because he's off at another one, but uh, many, many thanks to Sergei and his work. One of the first, uh, one of the first uh, people who came to our mind was Professor Young Tan and uh, his work that he's done on structural economic models and uh, so we are very honored to have him today as our tutorial speaker. He's also, uh, Young is the Michael Foster Professor of Information Systems at the Foster School of Business at the University of Washington. Colleague, very good friend, and uh, again, a great colleague, great friend. Uh, joining him also is uh, Professor Stephanie Lee, also colleague at the assistant professor at the Foster School of Information Systems and Yang Wang, who is assistant professor at Carnegie Mellon, um, at Carnegie Mellon University, my alma mater, in fact. And uh, so thank you all for, uh, for coming in and uh, doing this tutorial. So with that said, I'll turn it over to Professor Tan, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Ted, for your uh, kind introduction and uh, thank you and Sergey for inviting us to uh, work on this uh, fun project and actually had a great time working with my um, two co-authors Ian and Stephanie. So uh, today we're going to uh, discuss structural econometric models and uh, so uh, basically as you know that of course that uh, structural modeling belongs to empirical research right. So uh, we all know that the uh, essential element of uh, behavioral research at uh, the, uh, the uh, empirical research would be data, right? So let's start with data. And uh, so once we have a data set, then typically what we do is that uh, we need to uh, categorize, uh, categorize the uh, data variables into basically two categories and uh, uh, endogenous variables and uh, uh, exogenous variables. So the reason for doing so is that we want to uh, establish a causal relationship um, that would be uh, reflected uh, in the data. So uh, once we have uh, a set of uh, exogenous variables and then if we can somehow uh, make uh, the connection or uh, it, this is a direct connection to the endogenous variables and then we are successful in establishing causal uh, relationship uh, in the data. So of course among other things that we have uh, you know, distribution of the data that we have, and this is uh, especially important uh, if we want to use proper model, right? So uh, data would have different distributions, and of course that uh, a count variable uh, model would be different from continuous variable, uh, the, uh, the model. And uh, so uh, once we have uh, your research uh, questions in mind, we have research idea, we have the research framework set up, then what we can do is to go to the next step and to specify the model that would uh, allow us to uh, basically um, uh, include the causal relationship uh, in the model specification. So uh, in general, so I'll come back to this and uh, so what we do is that, um, so uh, we can have a mathematical uh, formulation that would uh, uh, include the input from the uh, data endogenous variable, exogenous variable, and also many often that we have to specifically model unobserved uh, factors. Those are what we call the unobservables or the uh, latent variables, U, I, uh, in the formulation. So theta will be the model parameters and uh, uh, most cases, and this would uh, actually allow us to measure the uh, marginal effect of some of the uh, key variables we uh, are interested in exploring. So uh, many often that uh, this is what we call the kind of structure model and it's pretty sort of a generic form. And uh, now many often that we are running into uh, the uh, trouble in the second uh, stage which is uh, models 
uh, identification. So that's a challenge for us to basically uh, um, identify or estimate uh, the model parameters theta, right? So uh, we know that one of the challenges basically endogeneity uh, the issue, and if we have a very simple example, suppose we want to model uh, the relationship between demand and supply, right? So we know that they depend on each other. So then uh, we need at least two equations uh, to basically model the relationship among them. Even we start with a very uh, 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 basic like linear form, and uh, so as long as uh, they appear on the left-hand side of the equation and they become endogenous, right? And then in that case, and then we all know that endogeneity will kill the uh, proper identification. So, but luckily in some situations, we'll be able to solve, for example, this uh, coupled linear equation um, and uh, uh, express demand supply separately, independent of each other, but uh, depending on other uh, uh, variables. So then we can properly identify uh, the uh, model parameters, and then that's what we call the reduced form. Okay, so reduced form specification, of course, would have certain advantages. It's simpler, and then it can actually uh, help us to identify uh, the model parameters. But the problem is that once we make the transformation, and pi, uh, will, depending on how uh, we can rearrange uh, uh, the uh, the terms from the uh, theta, so pi. Uh, we cannot interpret them directly because they lose the original meaning that we have uh, in theta. So uh, coming back to a little bit formal definition, and um, so structural model would actually be a specification where we rely heavily on economic theory and behavior theory or whatever other theories that uh, you use to uh, build a theoretical foundation, right, to uh, help you with uh, the uh, uh, the uh, uh, reflection of uh, the uh, underlying process uh, in uh, the data. So, of course, that, uh, you know, as any other empirical model, we use this to basically test theory, and also uh, I'll come back to this, and we can actually predict uh, the behaviors of the agents, uh, um, you know, the uh, users or the firms that under study. So, uh, of course, that, uh, you may ask, uh, why do we need to use the structural models, right? So, uh, so one that we actually have uh, richer uh, data, and uh, typically the structural model would be, I mean, not always, but uh, uh, with a dynamic feature. So we, if we have panel data with time theory plus cross-sectional uh, observations, we can certainly apply structural model. Uh, and uh, so I'll come back to talk about the uh, benefits of uh, doing structural modeling. And uh, again, this is also allowing us to explicitly embed the underlying uh, theory uh, in the model specification, right? So uh, to the end, what we want to achieve is that we want to have uh, the model which would uh, be very, very actively reflect the data generation process. So um, uh, in some of the reduced form models, and then uh, that is uh, uh, kind of um, uh, not uh, possible. So um, so some of the characteristics of uh, the structure um, the, uh, models would be, for example, uh, as I just mentioned about dynamic behavior and also uh, about uh, state dependency. So state is typically defined as a combination of uh, uh, the variables that would describe the characteristic of individual and also the environment uh, that could be observed and unobserved. So the reason we have uh, state variables would be uh, that we can more accurately uh, uh, describe uh, the behavior or actions or decisions of uh, the uh, uh, individuals or the form. So uh, typically, uh, when we have uh, the dynamic structure, then we have uh, the state to be uh, evolving dynamically over time, right? So that's uh, typically uh, common uh, in the data set. Uh, one other thing that uh, we can incorporate explicitly in the, the model will be uh, what we call the forward-looking behavior. So basically, uh, your decision at the current time will be dependent on uh, the future, right? So uh, we can come up with all sorts of scenarios that can happen, and uh, uh, so you, you are not making basically myopic decision just focusing on the current state, but then you anticipate uh, the consequence of your current decision uh, in the future, and then you incorporate them uh, into the decision-making at the current time. 
So, uh, so this, of course, uh, would uh, be uh, allowing uh, us to use, for example, discounted utility uh, as a objective function instead of uh, just the impured uh, utility. So, um, and uh, also that, uh, so uh, again, this is also related to the state dependency and then some of the, uh, 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 the, the models can respond to the exogenous variables um, dynamically. So uh, uh, in my own view, I, I think that two uh, advantages of using structural modeling approach would be first that we can actually uh, uh, proactively uh, 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 tackle this uh, uh, problem of uh, endogeneity uh, bias in the estimation, right? So we all know uh, the reason why we see the uh, endogeneity in our, for example, reduced form uh, specification is where that um, uh, we have some of the variables which will be correlated with unobservables, right, in the error terms. So now with the structural model itself, we actually uh, put specific effort into um, modeling the uh, latent variables. So we can actually uh, use, uh, uh, we, we don't need to have the data, right, because they are unobserved. Uh, so, uh, but uh, for example, sometimes that we know the factors that would uh, impact uh, those latent state or latent, latent variables. So, so in a way that we can actually proactively establish relationship between uh, latent uh, uh, the, uh, or unobserved variables with some of the uh, key variables we uh, have. So that's one advantage. Uh, so that's why sometimes, of course, that this will come uh, without, um, it's not coming without cost because that, uh, uh, in order to, you know, uh, to, to establish some of the relationship, then we op many often need to make assumptions. So uh, that's where sometimes you get uh, your reviewers to be unhappy about. So again, uh, we need to go back to uh, the very orgi original idea of uh, doing the structured modeling that we have to ground our model specification in very uh, strong theoretical uh, uh, underpinning. So uh, the second one, uh, which uh, is uh, also uh, very, very useful, is that we can actually uh, run a simulation uh, to uh, predict uh, the uh, form of individual uh, decision of behavior, uh, especially under new policy, right? So this would actually give us a very good managerial uh, implications. And uh, uh, once you come to make uh, suggestions for the managers uh, to uh, optimize uh, the policies they have. So it's kind of like running an experiment without actually running it, right? So it's a kind of like simulated experiment that we run. So what will happen is that, uh, so once you estimate uh, the structural model, you uh, figure out the model parameters and then, uh, then we can uh, basically um, uh, propose some of the new, newer, uh, new policies and that um, uh, would uh, hopefully uh, impact individuals or, or the firms to behave differently, then we can aggregate the overall effect and come up with a measure and to see the new policy is actually uh, better than the existing policy. For example, if we have the uh, promotional policy and then uh, we can actually use this approach to optimize the actual dollar amount, right? So that uh, would actually uh, benefit, for example, uh, the companies the best. So I, I see that this is also a significant uh, advantage of using structural modeling. And uh, uh, so we don't have to sort of, you know, um, uh, come up with, uh, have to worry about uh, uh, coming up with uh, the uh, managerial implications. And uh, uh, not only we can do that, but we can actually quantify it. We can come up with a more convincing uh, evidence why um, the uh, newer policies would actually uh, be uh, better. So um, I'm going to just briefly talk about this and uh, would, uh, hand it over to my two um, co-authors uh, to talk about these two models uh, more uh, in more detail. So uh, there are kind of all sorts of models uh, there. And uh, so I think um, most um, uh, Commonly known <coughs> would be uh, single agent model and dynamic games, right? Single agent model, again, would have a characteristic, and then uh, Ian will talk about this of uh, forward looking. So we use a, uh, you, uh, the discounted utility function, and then uh, you have to uh, solve the Bellman equation because it would involve the dynamic uh, programming uh, to uh, find the, uh, the optimal solution. 
And uh, of course, that uh, once we get into uh, the situation where the agents are interacting uh, with each other, and then we end up uh, with the uh, game uh, theoretical uh, setting, and then uh, all this uh, concept of equilibria uh, will come into uh, play. So uh, Stephanie will talk about uh, 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 the two also very uh, useful, interesting model, demand estimation and uh, uh, matching model. Demand, situa uh, demand estimation actually is a very uh, uh, lead uh, model, which is often referred to as a BOP model. So this is where we have actually aggregate data, right? So we have market share, but we don't have individual uh, decision uh, uh, whether they have uh, made purchase or not. Uh, the, the, I think the beauty of this model is that uh, we actually start from individual level and we try to model their decision making. And uh, if you go that level, you can actually uh, incorporate like uh, individual heterogeneity and uh, uh, among other things. And uh, once you aggregate right, individuals at, like a decision making and then you come to the uh, level uh, where we actually have the data, which is uh, market share. So. Uh, matching model, of course, that will rely on the uh, pairwise stability, and uh, this uh, would uh, often be applied uh, in um, a situation such as a uh, two-sided market where you have buyers and sellers, and then uh, some other situation like uh, you have investors and uh, uh, lenders, and then uh, uh, in many other settings where uh, you can actually uh, find a pair and see how uh, they actually find each other and uh, uh, to uh, uh, basically achieve uh, certain objectives. All right, so uh, I'm uh, happy to hand over to uh, Stephanie. Uh, uh, she's going to uh, talk about the uh, demand estimation and the matching model. Um, thank you so much, Yang. Um, so now I'm going to discuss the demand estimation and matching component of this tutorial. So in a lot of empirical research, um, the demand estimation has been a very important component. So when we had demand estimates, we can um, examine the market power, we can examine the consequences of mergers, and also value new goods. And as Professor Tan mentioned, a common problem that uh, we face as a researcher is that we often do not observe um, individual level data. Instead, what we have here is the aggregate level data. So the main question that the uh, demand estimation is trying to tackle is how can we recover consumer heterogeneity when um, we do not have uh, individual information? And in order to answer that question, we rely on random coefficient model, and we, or what we also call the BLP model. And uh, the method has been applied in a very different settings and in many different industries, and in order to address many different uh, economic questions uh, and management questions. So the key major advantage of the BLP method is that um, the model can be estimated using the only the market level price and quantity data, and it can also flexibly uh, capture more of a realistic substitution pattern um, that we see in the, uh, in the market. So before going into the details of the BLP model, uh, let me first uh, cover the, some of the basics of the uh, uh, demand estimation problem and first present the homogeneous logic model. And then we can talk about the BLP model, which builds upon the homogeneous logic model. So uh, let's begin by talking about the homogeneous logic model. So here is the setup of the model. So in a logic model, um, all agents have the same parameters, and there is no heterogeneity in taste. And so let's assume that we have total of T markets with a total of I consumers. And each consumer I uh, makes a choice between J different products. And so we can write the indirect utility of consumer I in uh, market T for product J in the following way, where we have U equals X times beta 
minus alpha times p plus the psi and plus psi and then the epsilon um, error term. So here, what we have here is x is the um, vector of observable product characteristics, and p is the price of the product. So the beta is the coefficient on the observed characteristics, and here we have alpha as the price coefficient. And psi is the unobservable product characteristics, and um, epsilon is the error term. And we can rewrite this um, indirect utility function in a more concise form. And here is a concise form. Um, um, so here's, we have u, u is going to be equal to delta plus the epsilon. So here, uh, delta is going to equal to x beta minus alpha times p plus psi. Okay? And when we utilize the outside uh, 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 good to uh, be zero, and we also assume that the error term follows the type one extreme uh, value distribution. So what is really nice about the type one uh, value distribution is that it allows to uh, us to uh, write the market share in the following form. Um, and for this reason, um, logic model is often used a lot in a discrete choice model. And another thing that is really convenient about this uh, model is that when you take logs on both sides of the equation, it will give you a system of linear equation that you can just easily estimate by using regressions. And um, if there's no endogeneity issue, then we can estimate uh, the systems of linear regression using OLS. And um, if we do have an uh, endogeneity problem, then we can use instrumental variables and um, estimate the, uh, the model. So what is really nice about the homogeneous model is that it is very uh, computationally convenient. Okay. And however, but there is an important drawback to uh, this logic model. What happens is a logic model imposes a very um, unrealistic restriction on the data. And this can be easily noted uh, when you look at the own price elasticity and the cross price elasticity measure. So here uh, uh, at the top of the slide, uh, what we have in the first uh, line is the um, uh, own price elasticity. And on the second line, we have the cross uh, price elasticity. And when you take a closer look at the uh, price elasticities, you're gonna see that, for example, at the top for the own price elasticity, um, the higher the price, higher uh, um, the price, higher uh, the elasticity is going to be. And when you think about it, this is uh, unrealistic and is not appropriate in many of the um, industrial settings. So. Um, uh, we would assume that um, people who buy expensive products are going to probably going to be less sensitive to price, right? But in, uh, in this own price elasticity measure, we don't actually see that pattern. And in the second line, here what we see is the cross price elasticity measure. And um, you can see that it only depends on market shares and prices. And it for example, it doesn't depend on the product characteristics of the similar goods. And this creates uh, independence of irrelevant alternative problem, or what we call the IIA problem. And because of the IIA problem, we often see very weird substitution patterns. And, um, because of these limitations of logic models, what we have here is uh, we want to address these problems by uh, uh, adding more flexibility to the model. And now that's, uh, that is why we have what we call the random coefficients logic model. So, um, so Barry, Levinson, and Pakes um, introduced heterogeneity into the homogeneous logic model that we just saw. Uh, by adding random coefficient. So um, it's also called the BLP model because um, it was introduced by Barry, Levinson, and Peake. So, so we first take the initials and uh, hence the name the BLP model. 
So um, as before, as um, uh, similar to the uh, homogeneous logic model, we have the utility function that you see here on the screen. Uh, utility is again equal to x times beta minus alpha times p plus psi and the epsilon term. But uh, you should note that an important difference here is that instead of beta and alpha, what we now have here is beta i and alpha i. So now uh, we incorporate heterogeneity in taste across individual by uh, putting the subscript i in here. Okay. And uh, we assume that beta and alpha uh, follow the distribution that you see here on the screen, where uh, beta bar and alpha bar are the, uh, the mean of the population. And D um, is uh, the consumer level observables, for example, observable demographic characteristics. And we have pi as a coefficient um, for the observable uh, consumer characteristics. And then we have uh, V, uh, which is the consumer level unobservable uh, variables. And then we have um, sigma, which is the uh, variance covariance scaling matrix. So um, when you take a closer look at this model, you will be able to notice that we can actually decompose this model into two different components. So uh, what we have here is we are now uh, decomposing utility into the component delta tj and mu i tj. Okay. Um, so um, the, uh, the first part, the delta tj is what we call the mean level of utility. Okay. And then um, here uh, we have mu i tj, uh, which is the second component, and it captures the individual deviation um, uh, from the model, and it captures the effect of random taste parameters. And uh, because it is capturing the individual deviation, that is why we have the subscript i here at uh, mu i tj. Um, and theta i um, is going to uh, denote the uh, coefficients on uh, price um, and um, observable characteristics, so alpha and beta. And theta 2 uh, refers to uh, uh, pi and, also, uh, and sigma, which enter the utility function in a nonlinear way. So, um, when we, as before, when we assume that the error term follows the type one um, val, uh, ex, uh, val, uh, extreme distribution, uh, similar to homogeneous logic model, we can uh, get the logic form of the market share. So we can conveniently write the market share in the following way. Um, but, and we can calculate Again, as before, the price elasticities, uh, both the uh, own price elasticity and the cross price elasticity in the following way. And we can uh, easily note that when we uh, look at uh, these price elasticities have a much more flexible form. For example, when we first look at the own price elasticity, what you're gonna be able to see is that it no, uh, the price elasticity is no longer determined by a single parameter alpha. Instead, we have alpha i, uh, which allows to capture the individual um, heterogeneity in uh, the price, uh, elast uh, price coefficient. And also, when you look at the, uh, the cross elasticity in the second line over here, um, you will be able to see that the substitution patterns are much more flexible now. And so, for example, if the price of a product goes up, well, uh, you're going to be able to find that you're going to be more likely to switch to a product that uh, has similar characteristics. And so, in the BLP model, we no longer have the IIA problem that was present in the uh, homogeneous logic model. And that is one key benefit of the BLP model. Um, so, now we understand the uh, basic setup of the BLP model. Uh, let's talk about how we can estimate uh, these models. So, um, 
we now know that the market share um, is given by the previous equation that you saw. And we actually observe the actual market share in the data. And so goal, our goal is to find the parameters that matches the observed market shares with the uh, equation that you previously saw. Okay. And um, when you think about it, solving these equations directly will actually lead to uh, bias estimates because oftentimes, psi, uh, the unobservable product characteristics, will be potentially going to be correlated with the price measure P. So um, in order to consistently estimate the BLP model, what we rely on is the instrumental variables. We, wanna, uh, set, we want a set of uh, values instruments that are correlated with our price, but at the same time, uh, uncorrelated with, this, uh, with the uh, with unobservable uh, characteristic, uh, xi. Okay. And um, I'm listing here three very common um, instrumental variables that are used in the literature. Um, so the first one that we have here uh, is the cost shifters, uh, uh, as proposed by Nevo. And um, these are the variables that shift your cost. Uh, your cost meaning uh, your production cost, maybe packaging cost, distribution cost, and so forth. So the main reasoning behind this particular um, instrumental variable is that those cost shifters is going to have direct effect on your price, but it will uh, not have uh, effect on the demand for that particular product. So that is the first um, IV that is commonly used. Um, and the second IV that is also commonly used is the um, prices of products in other markets. So the reasoning and idea behind this IV is that prices of uh, uh, products in other markets will be correlated with the prices of the product in the current market. But uh, we, uh, when you assume that the demand shocks are um, IID across uh, markets, then we can uh, make an assumption that uh, this particular measure is uncorrelated with the demand. And the third commonly used IV um, is the characteristics of competing goods. Um, the reasoning behind this uh, uh, being uh, that a firm is going, when they set a price, they are going to take into account uh, characteristics of competing products. But uh, these characteristics will not have direct effect on the demand for uh, your particular product. Okay, so these are uh, uh, three very commonly used IVs um, in the BLP model. So um, now we can actually move on to discuss about how we are going to actually um, estimate the BLP model. So um, we're gonna uh, discuss some of the computational details of the BLP uh, model algorithm. Um, so again, at the core, what we want to do um, is we want to find the estimates that matches the observable uh, market shares. Um, market shares. So um, I'm going to talk uh, step by step how this algorithm works. So the first step is what we call the initialization. So in this step, we want to first start with our initial guesses uh, for theta two. And theta two are the parameters um, that enter the utility uh, nonlinearly, which was uh, uh, pi and also um, uh, pi uh, and sigma in um, our utility function. And then, uh, given this initial guess, what we do is we draw vi from uh, the distribution. And, um, and then, uh, we, uh, we, uh, once we draw VI, we can actually compute the market share. And uh, to do so, we're also going to need the initial uh, value for uh, del initial guess for delta as well. And a common suggestion um, uh, when you choose which uh, uh, delta to use is that you first estimate the homogeneous logic model that was first introduced uh, in the first uh, part of the demand estimation uh, um, tutorial and, you, uh, and use those estimates from the homogeneous logic model uh, so that uh, your algorithm can converge faster. Okay. And the next step is that once you have your um, uh, initial um, um, 
um, uh, uh, initial guesses, uh, you want to compute the market share based on the model. And uh, we're gonna let uh, H be the index of iteration. And um, for a given value of theta two and delta, uh, what you can do is uh, you can uh, take the integral of the market share uh, uh, of an, uh, across individuals to get the market share. Um, but a common prob uh, uh, challenge here is that um, um, you, uh, we, uh, we, this integral cannot be computed uh, by, uh, uh, by an, uh, using analytical solution. So a solution here is to use simulations. So what we do is uh, we draw NS here. Um, NS denotes the number of uh, simulation that we draw. And, and, and we fix them for the estimation. And then we approximate the integral uh, using the equation that you see here on the screen. And um, so the following step, the step two, um, is to uh, find delta uh, that actually uh, matches the, uh, the observed market share given theta two. So what we do is we wanna choose delta so that it minimizes the distance uh, of the predicted market share from the model with the actual observed market share. And we do this by using contraction mapping, uh, where you iterate the series until the series converges. And so you can uh, use this equation that you see here on the screen to find the value of delta uh, by making initial guesses and evaluating the series until it converges. And um, now in the next step, what we wanna do is we wanna actually compute the error term and we can rewrite the error term xi in the following way. So it's gonna be the delta uh, uh, minus uh, um, xi times theta i. Okay. And um, again, um, uh, this delta um, has been computed from the uh, previous step. So now here, uh, um, as we discussed before, um, the uh, BLP models um, faces the endogeneity problem. So now we use instruments in order to get uh, the, uh, the estimator uh, uh, that we're gonna uh, solve using the generalized method of movements or also what we call the GMM. Okay. So the GMM objective function is going to be given by the formula that you see here uh, at the bottom of the uh, slide. Uh, where um, phi um, is going to be the, uh, the, uh, the weight matrix. Uh, now that we have our um, objective function, we are, what we're gonna do is we are going to uh, search for theta two that actually minimizes the objective function that we have. And the model parameters are actually estimated in two steps. So the first, in the first step, uh, we express theta one um, as a function of theta two. And then um, in the second step, what we do is we perform a nonlinear uh, search over theta two that minimizes the objective function that we have over there. Okay. And what we do is we reiterate this um, step two to four for every guesses of, of theta two until it converges. And it will uh, give you uh, uh, the BLP estimates. At the end of this um, algorithm, you're gonna get the BLP estimates of theta one and theta two. And using those um, estimates, you can um, uh, do many different counterfactual analysis and simulations. For example, you can examine how the demand is going to change with mergers. You can also evaluate the value of new goods and so on. And BLP is a very popular model um, because as you can see, it handles the aggregate level data. And at the same time, it allows for individual um, heterogeneity um, uh, for taste. And also, it also allows you to take into account the endogeneity problem. Okay. So um, now I'm gonna switch gear and talk uh, more about the uh, matching model. So the basic uh, uh, motivation for the matching model is that um, we often observe data on different relationships. So uh, for example, we see uh, who is married with whom, 
um, which student goes to which uh, school, um, who works for which job, and so on. And matching model is one uh, framework that allows you to uh, model the equilibrium formation in, uh, for these relationships. And we uh, uh, term this, uh, uh, we call these relationship a match. There are many examples of, of matching markets. Uh, one common example is the question of uh, school choice market. Um, in a lot of uh, countries, um, children are oftentimes automatically sent to uh, school in their neighborhood. But uh, recently, more and more schools are, um, uh, and are employing the school choice program where you take into account the uh, preferences for children and parents when they assign students to uh, schools. And because school seats are limited, you, may, you need to make a decision as to how you are going to match student with a school. Okay. So um, here a key uh, question would be, how can school district decide the placement of students um, in the school? This is one just simple example of a matching model. Um, other examples can include uh, marriage market, job market, uh, dating market, and so on. And today, uh, with the rise of many different online platforms, uh, matching model has become more and more relevant. Um, so we see a lot of uh, sharing economy market where you match uh, two sides, and also we see uh, online dating market and, uh, and, and online labor market and so forth. So, um, before we move on to uh, talk about the structural estimations of the matching model, I will first describe some of the basic uh, matching model theory and uh, uh, terminologies. And then we will discuss about the recent structural work uh, using matching models. So here, um, two-sided market uh, is where um, agent on one side of the market uh, needs to be matched with agents on the other side of the market. And um, the simplest two-sided uh, matching market that we have is what we call the 101 uh, model. And oftentimes in the literatures, uh, this one-to-one -one market is also called the marriage market. So in this one-on-one -on -one model, um, uh, uh, it consists of two distinct choices of players. Um, here the players are denoted by M and W, and M is the set of men uh, given by those elements M1 through MK, and W is the set of women uh, given by W1 to WP. And we say that the market is two-sided, so that each man has preferences over woman, and each woman has preferences over men. And MI uh, can have uh, pres uh, preferences over the set of W and also MI. Here, uh, what MI means is that it refers to uh, being matched to himself, or um, in the case of marriage market, uh, remaining single. Um, so, um, um, preferences of men MI is uh, denoted by PMI, um, and um, it is an ordered list of preferences. So, in the case of MI we see over there, we can see that MI's first preference is to get matched with uh, WK, his second preference is to be matched by WL, and so on, uh, uh, and then um, he prefers being matched to himself uh, than being matched to uh, WJ. Okay. Um, uh, Notation-wise, so W greater than um, M subscript W prime refers to that M prefers W to W prime, and similarly, um, uh, W um, greater than equal to subscript M W prime means that M prefers W at least as well as uh, W prime. And we also assume that all these preferences are complete and transitive, meaning that complete preferences uh, uh, mean that any two alternatives can be compared, and transitive uh, preference meaning that uh, if A is preferred to B and B is preferred to A, then A is preferred to C. Okay. Formally, 
we say uh, a relationship uh, or the outcome of a game is matching mu, uh, when uh, and the matching is denoted by uh, uh, mu here, uh, denoted by mu here, and the mu is the correspondent that satisfies following uh, these three conditions. Okay. And um, so, for example, uh, mu w is in the subset of the um, is an element of, of M union W, which means that uh, W is matched to some M or remains unmatched. Okay. And similarly, mu M is an element of W union uh, M. And here, what we have here is W is equal to mu M if and only if mu W is equal to M. So this means that the matching is mutual, and it means that M is matched to, to W, if and only if W is matched with M. Okay. And the most important concept uh, in the matching model, the equilibrium concept, is the concept of stability. Uh, matching is called stable um, if there are no individual player or pairs of player who profitably deviate from their match. In other words, matching is stable if there's no one who profitably gain by breaking the match. And a matching mu is blocked by individual k if k prefers being single to being matched with mu k. And it can also be blocked by a pair of agent uh, uh, m and w if they each prefer each other to the current outcome. Okay. And we say that the matching is pairwise stable if the matching is not blocked by any individual or any pair of agents. And uh, Gale and Shapley theorem is probably one of the most important theorem in the matching models. Um, Gale and Shapley theorem, what they did was they proved that uh, the stable matching exists in every marriage market, so every one-on-one -on -one market. And in order to prove that theorem, what they did was they used the uh, deferred acceptance algorithm. And uh, this algorithm ha actually has been the basis of matching in many different settings. So let me briefly walk you through what the deferred uh, preferred algorithm works like. So this version is where the man proposes, and we have a, a similar version where the woman proposes, but let's start with the one where men proposes. So first, um, we look at different preferences, and if uh, preferences are not strict, we arbitrarily break the tie. And then each man proposes to his most pre uh, 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 pre uh, preferred woman. And in the second step, uh, each woman rejects any unacceptable proposals, and if there's none, if there's more than one acceptable proposer is received, she just holds to the most preferred and rejects all the rest. Okay, and um, and this process uh, is repeated. Uh, 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 repeated. So any man who was rejected at uh, the previous step makes a new proposal to um, its most preferable uh, mate who hasn't yet rejected him. And again, each woman holds her most preferred acceptable offer to date and reject the rest. And so this step is repeated until no further proposal is made. And at the end, what we do is we match each woman to the man uh, whose proposal she's holding on to. And uh, this is the version where the male propose, man proposes, but there's also a woman proposing version of the algorithm where we begin by woman proposing first and, uh, to her first choice uh, until um, she has the acceptable choices. And what it does is it ensures that the stable matching exists for every uh, marriage market. So um, uh, matching that is produced by deferred acceptance algorithm is, is self-stable. So um, if someone would have preferred to be matched to a woman other than his current assigned mate, this means that he must have already proposed to her. And at the same time, uh, it means that uh, she has rejected him, meaning that she has one uh, man she strictly prefers, and hence that they, there cannot be any um, uh, blocking pairs. 
And we actually see a lot of different uh, um, uh, the, uh, the uh, stable markets in the real life. So the stability is an interesting concept. And the question is where um, whether it really holds um, in um, real life. And when uh, there was a study that looked at uh, medical matches, and what they actually found was that among many different matching algorithms, the stable matching algorithms are the ones that are being successively used um, uh, and still in use, but a lot of the unstable mechanisms were abandoned after a short period of time. So an easy extension to the one-on-one -on -one matching model is the many-to-one matching model. Um, um, which is also referred as the college admission level uh, model. And um, in many to one matching model, um, uh, for example, college admits uh, many students, but students can only attend one college and so forth. And for example, um, firms apply uh, many workers, but uh, workers can only choose one firm to work for. So here's a basic setup of the many-to-one matching model. The only difference here is that for college C, and uh, what, what, what we have now is that we have different number of positions or quota, uh, Q1 to Qn. Okay. And um, the Gale and Shapley theorem is also applicable in many-to-one matching model as well. So, um, Stable matching always exists in many-to-one matching. Again, this can be proven by using the deferred acceptance algorithm. Um, the only tweak here is that you can think of college C as Q's many, uh, Q different colleges with one position each. And then you can reapply the, uh, uh, um, the uh, deferred acceptance algorithm. So for good references for the matching theory, uh, you can refer to uh, Al Roth and Soto Meyer's um, two-sided matching, a study uh, in game theoretic uh, game, a theoretic modeling and analysis. And um, so far, uh, matching theory um, has been much more developed uh, compared to empirical work. But there has been growing literature uh, in using matching model in the empirical work. So now that we have covered some basic terminologies and theorems for the matching model, um, I will briefly uh, share with you some of, the com uh, some of the recent empirical work using matching model. So, um, so the structural, um, again, um, structural, the advantage of the structural approach is that it allows you to do different counterfactual and different simulations. It also allows you to, uh, uh, get the parameter, uh, uh, compute the economic uh, parameters that you cannot be, uh, 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 directly observe. So um, in estimating the, uh, the, um, uh, the uh, matching model, a common strategy is to use a simulated maximum likelihood or simulated method of moments. So the simulation, uh, simulation estimators are conceptually pretty straightforward, but it can be computationally burdensome. So some of the key um, examples um, in the literature that uses um, simulation estimators are Boyd on matching um, public school teachers to um, schools, and also Argawal on matching in the residency market. And another very common uh, uh, matching uh, method that is commonly used is the inequality method. So um, in the inequality method, uh, what we do is we uh, maximize the number of inequalities that are implied by pairwise stability that holds true. And what's nice about this approach is that this approach actually breaks the tie, uh, breaks the, uh, the computational curse of dimensionality. And the code for the um, uh, this uh, inequality method is actually available on uh, Jeremy Fox's website. And uh, Fox actually applied this um, estimator on uh, when they were uh, when he was estimating the uh, the market for car parts. And for references on empirical work using matching models, uh, you can refer to Fox for a brief review and also uh, Graham for a longer review. And, um, the, and the applications of matching models include Marriage Market by Chu and So, 
And actually, Sorensen also used uh, the matching model to correct for the selection problem in the venture capital market. And um, the key point of the matching model is that they use stability equilibrium, the pairwise stability equilibrium, um, in order to uh, get the estimates of the parameters by using the uh, uh, match outcome data. So um, now um, uh, this concludes the uh, matching and demand component. And uh, now uh, Professor Yen is going to talk about the dynamic models. So thanks, Stephanie. Uh, so next, I'm going to introduce a new class of models, uh, dynamic discrete choice models. So in the interest of time, I will actually move relatively fast. And you are welcome to check out our tutorial article. And also, we are happy to take any questions you might have about the details of the es estimation offline. So here, uh, we have two keywords. Uh, the first one is discrete. So here we're assuming that agents are choosing among a number of discrete alternatives or options. The second keyword is dynamic. So in dynamic discrete choice models, uh, agents' current period decision will have an impact on their future utility or future payoff. Therefore, for rational agents, they will be forward-looking. Uh, they will make decision that maximizes their uh, expected intertemporal payoff or their lifetime utility. Okay. So here are some examples of papers that use dynamic discrete choice models to understand agents' behavior in their respective contexts. So the first example is a very seminal paper by Erden and King. So in this paper, the authors actually use a dynamic discrete choice model to capture consumer learning under quality uncertainty. So the intertemporal trade-off in this contest is choosing the, uh, the, the product or the brand that maximizes the current period expected consumption utility versus trying different brands or different products to learn about the quality of these different brands or products and reduce the uncertainty in future decision making. The second example is Liu and al. 2016, and in this paper, the authors actually use a dynamic discrete choice model to uh, capture how pharmaceutical companies make detailing decisions. So companies' detailing efforts in the current period will affect their relationships with the physicians, and that will have an impact on physicians' future prescription behavior and also the firm's payoff. Okay. So that's the intertemporal dependence in this particular context. So the last example is one of my own papers. Uh, so in this paper, my co-authors and I actually develop a dynamic discrete choice model to capture solvers' participation behavior in dynamic crowdsourcing contests. So the solvers, so by participation, I'm talking about solvers' entry decision and also their decision on whether to make follow-up submissions. So um, uh, so the agents or the uh, solvers in this case, they will incur a cost to make submissions to the contest. For example, for example, design a logo and submit it to the contest. So there is no immediate payoff. However, by making new submissions, uh, the first submission and additional submissions, they can actually increase their chance of winning the contest and receive the award at the end of the contest. So that's the intertemporal dependence in the uh, third example. Okay. So at a high level, what does a dynamic discrete choice model do? Uh, so a dynamic discrete choice model will describe uh, agents' preferences and beliefs, and it will also describe how states evolve as, uh, as a function from period to period, and typically as a function of the uh, actions that individual takes. Okay. So the parameters, because of the dynamic structure of these models, uh, to estimate the parameters in these models, we typically need longitudinal data. Okay? So we need longitudinal data to estimate parameters in the dynamic discrete choice model. 
And estimating dynamic discrete choice models is actually quite challenging because um, in these models, agents are assumed to be forward-looking and they make decisions based on the expected uh, lifetime utility instead of the current period utility. So the expected lifetime utility is often a complex function of the utility parameters. So when estimating these models, we need to come up with a reasonable estimate of these lifetime values. So you will see that the uh, estimation methods I'm going to talk about, they all central around how to actually uh, uh, come up with a good estimate for the intertemporal payoff or the lifetime utility. So depending on whether the agents are interacting with each other, uh, we can categorize the dynamic discrete choice models into two classes. The first one is the single agent dynamic model or dynamic discrete choice model. And in this type of models, uh, agents are assumed to be independent of each other. And the second example, uh, the second class is the dynamic game models. In dynamic game models, agents are interacting each, with each other, and also the concept of equilibrium is applied. Now, if you think about the three examples I gave you uh, on the previous slide, the first example is actually, it falls into the first class, uh, single agent uh, discrete uh, choice, uh, single agent dynamic discrete choice models, uh, because uh, individuals' consumption utility is not affected by other people's consumption behavior. And the second and the third example actually falls, uh, fall into the second uh, class, uh, dynamic game models. Okay. So now let's first take a look at how to develop and estimate a single agent dynamic discrete choice model. So I'm going to use Rust's bus engine replacement uh, problem as an example for this part of the presentation. So um, uh, the setup is as the following. Uh, assume that the company has N buses and uh, the buses are indexed by I. And the decision the company makes on each of the buses in each period is whether to replace the engine of the bus or not. Oh, so this is the binary decision. Uh, so here we use uh, D sub I T to denote the decision on bus I in period T, uh, with one indicating the replacement decision and zero indi indicating not replace, uh, sorry, with one indicating that the engine is being replaced and zero otherwise. Now the state variable in this contest is basically the cumulative mileage on bus ice engine since the last replacement. Okay. The evolution of this state variable is actually quite straightforward. So if we decide to, the company decides to replace the uh, engine of the bus in the current period, then the cumulative mileage is reset to zero. Otherwise, the next period uh, uh, cumulative mileage is basically the current period cumulative mileage plus the current period mileage, the additional mileage that occurs in the current period, that will be, the sum of these two will be the next period uh, cumulative mileage. Okay. So that's basically how the state evolves in this particular setting. Now the single period utility can be expressed in this way. So here you can see we have two cases. The first case corresponds to the decision of replacing the engine, and the second case corresponds to the decision of not replacing the engine. So when the company decides to replace the engine, then the company incurs, first of all, a replacement cost, which is denoted by C sub R. And also, uh, here we assume that the replacement decision is made at the beginning of each period. So after the, uh, the firm incurs the replacement cost, uh, we also have this uh, second term, which is the operating cost. Uh, the operating cost is assumed to be an increasing differentiable function of the state variable, which is the cumulative mileage um, of the, on, on the, the, uh, the bus engine. So uh, here you can see we have this uh, C sub O. So that's a set of parameters that actually determine the shape of the operating cost function. Okay. So here in the first case, the uh, operating cost is evaluated at the zero mileage. That is because we just replaced the engine. So the state is reset to zero. And so that's the second term. And the third term, epsilon uh, sub I, 1T, so that's the choice specific utility shock associated with the replacement decision, the decision of replacing the engine. So this will capture all the un unobservable factors that affect the utility 
of uh, a utility that the company uh, will receive or the cost that the company will incur uh, when they make the decision to replace the bus engine. Okay. Now the second case, uh, in, the, in the second case, uh, we don't have the replacement, replacement cost, C sub R, uh, but here the operating cost is evaluated at uh, XIT. Okay, so that will be a larger number. So um, we only have this operating cost and we still have that choice specific utility shock, which is epsilon sub I zero T. That's the shock associated with the no replacement decision. All right, so this is why if you look at the utility function, the utility, single period utility is a function of the decision D, the state variable X, and the utility shocks, uh, epsilon, and we use the semicolon to separate the variables from the uh, parameters. Theta one is basically the collection of the C sub R and C sub O. So these are the parameters that go into the single period utility function. So the replacement decision that the firm makes will try to maximize the expected discounted, uh, discounted intertemporal utility or the value function, which can be expressed in this way. So here is basically the sum of the discounted single period utility. Uh, so uh, uh, the expectation is taken over the, uh, the, all the future uh, states and the future uh, uh, utility shocks. Now, the intertemporal trade-off in this particular setting is basically if you uh, replace the engine now, the replacement cost will be relatively high. So you incur the cost now, but your future operating cost will be lower. Okay. If you want to save the replacement cost, you do not want to replace the bus engine now, you will incur a higher operating cost. So that's the intertemporal trade-off in this setting. So the value function that we saw on the previous slide can be written recursively in the following way. So if you're familiar with the dynamic programming, this should be uh, familiar to you. So basically, uh, I just want to introduce some notations here. So F is uh, basically the state transition density function given that the alternative J is selected. And then G is basically the probability density function of the utility shock epsilon. And also theta two uh, that goes here is basically the set of parameters that govern the state transition probabilities. Okay, so these are, so theta one and theta two are the parameters that we're going to estimate. So I would like to, you may notice that for this equation, to hold, we actually need to make some assumptions. So here I'm going to introduce a set of assumptions that are commonly made in the estimation of dynamic discrete choice models. So the first one is called additive separability. So this is to say that our uh, utility shock, this epsilon term, is additively separable from the deterministic part of the single period utility. Uh, this is a deterministic part of the single period utility function. So that's the first assumption. The second assumption is the evolution of the state variable follows a first order Markov process. So this means that my next period, uh, next period state is basically a function of the current period state and current period action, but not uh, the uh, last period, like T minus one uh, period uh, state and action. Okay. So the third assumption is conditional independence. So this is saying that the evolution of the state variable X is not dependent of the uh, utility shock epsilon. So this assumption is made for practical purposes. This will uh, make the uh, estimation of the, uh, of the uh, lifetime value or the future value much easier. And we further assume that the epsilon, this utility shock, is IID with respect to individual and periods. And again, this is uh, actually uh, to simplify the estimation, and also this assumes away any serial correlation uh, in the, in the uh, utility shock from period to period. And finally, we assume that the uh, state variable takes um, discrete values, uh, and also it has a finite dimensionality. Now with those assumptions, we can actually write the likelihood of observing a sequence of states and actions for a single individual or single agent, in this case, 
uh, a single bus. Uh, this is actually quite straightforward. I just want to call your attention to this last line here. So uh, if you look at this last line, you realize that we can actually separately estimate theta one and theta two, okay? So we'll start from theta two because that's easier to estimate. So theta two is basically the set of parameters that govern the stage transition process. Now, a very straightforward way to estimate the stage transition probabilities is basically using this, what's called frequency estimator. So basically, uh, here in the, 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 the numerator is basically the, the count of the, uh, the, the number of times that the combination of the state x um, action j and the next period state x prime, this combination that occurs in the data. The denominator is basically the number of times that the combination of state equaling x and the decision equaling y occurs in the data. So we can simply uh, calculate the, the ratio between the two that will be our uh, estimate of the state transition probability given that the current period state is x and the decision is j and the next period state is x prime. Okay. So this is actually a non-parametric estimator of the state transition probabilities. Alternatively, we can also estimate theta two parametrically, or estimate the state transition process parametrically, but these two methods both have pros and cons. So for non-parametric estimation, uh, basically we don't need to make any functional form assumptions, uh, so this estimate is truthful to data, but it may suffer, or it, it, we might have some issues with sparsity because we need sufficient data for any combination uh, of the uh, x, x prime and j. But if you use the parametric method, we won't have the sparsity issues. Uh, however, sometimes the uh, functional form may be inappropriately imposed. So that's the drawback of the parametric method. Okay. So that's the estimation for theta two. Now we will move on to estimating theta one. So for theta one, uh, again, in order to estimate theta one, we need to come up with a good estimate for the value function. Okay, so here, uh, if we assume that this epsilon term, the utility shock, is IID and follows the type one extreme value distribution, we can actually write the, what this is what's called conditional choice probability. That's the probability of choosing a certain alternative conditional on the state that we're in, X sub IT. So we can write this, this is a, a logic form. However, uh, you may notice that this term here, this is the deterministic part of the single period utility. Now, if we have a static model, our uh, conditional choice probability will only have this term. Now, because this is a dynamic model, people actually make decision based on not only the current period utility, but also future payoff. So we have this extra term here, beta times EV, so this is the expected future value. Okay. So, uh, by the way, this beta term that you probably have seen earlier is the discount factor. And it is known that the identification of discount factor is extremely challenging. So in this tutorial, we'll assume that the discount factor is given. Okay. But there are uh, recent papers talking about conditions where you can actually identify theta, uh, beta, the discount factor, but we're not going to touch that today. So. Going back to this equation, so here uh, we need to be able to estimate EV, right? Once we have that, we should be able to estimate the parameter, uh, parameters in theta one, uh, the, the theta one parameters. So notice that, so this is what, uh, the sort of the definition of EV, the future value. So this is, this is um, the, the, the integration is basically taken over uh, this uh, future period state the next period state and the next period shock. So this EV, that this EV term actually has a very useful property, which is this. So if you take a closer look at this equation, you will realize that uh, here we're writing EV as a function of itself. Okay. So essentially, if you can imagine we have a system of equations and this EV basically is a solution for the system of equations. And we can also use the contraction mapping to find out uh, the EV value. Okay, all right, so this is actually equation 28 in the article, so I'm actually going to refer to this equation, so let me just uh, quickly remind you that this is equation 20, 28, yeah. 
So next, I'm going to talk about two uh, methods to estimate uh, this theta one parameters. Okay, the first one is called the nested fixed point algorithm. So this is introduced by the uh, Rust 1987 paper itself. And the second method is called CCP-based two-step estimation methods proposed by Haas and Miller in 1993. Okay, so CCP is short for conditional choice probabilities. All right, so let's first take a look at the nested fixed point algorithm. So this algorithm involves four steps. Okay, the first step is to uh, assume an initial uh, guess for theta one. And then uh, we have a uh, iterative process. So we use K to denote the, uh, uh, to index the iteration. So we start, within each iteration, we start from an EV that uh, the, the, the set of EV values, uh, so that uh, the EV value for any combinations of X and J is zero. And then for any given value of theta one K, that's our guess in the current iteration for theta one, we'll iterate over that equation 28 that I show you, the one with the, the um, yellow background color, until EV converges. Then we will plug the converged EV values into the likelihood function and then follow the standard uh, maximum likelihood uh, estimation procedure to uh, update theta one. So that will become the next iteration theta one. So we'll repeat steps two and three until our uh, estimates for theta one converges. Okay. So this is called nested fixed point algorithm. All right. So the proposal of the uh, fix, uh, nested fixed point algorithm is considered a big leap in the uh, structural estimation uh, of dynamic uh, structural models. Uh, so nowadays there are still a lot of papers using this method to estimate the structural parameters. However, the major drawback of this nested fixed point algorithm is that it requires solving the uh, dynamic program for each trial value of theta one, which is computationally burdensome, and also the convergence of EV could be problematic when the state space is very large. So that is why a lot of researchers after the proposal of the uh, nested fixed point algorithm, a lot of researchers are looking for other ways to estimate theta one, which does not require, which do not require uh, a repeatedly solving the dynamic program for each trial value of theta one. So this is one of them. So this is a CCP-based two-step estimation method. So the main idea behind this method is we, instead of solving for the, uh, the, the value functions, we're going to use simulations to approximate the value functions. So to do that, we need to uh, actually get uh, the following ingredients. So we first need to uh, get a non-parametric uh, estimation, uh, estimation for the uh, conditional choice probabilities. And also we, we want to parametrically or non-parametrically estimate the state transition probabilities. And then we also need, uh, to, need to obtain an analytical relationship between the value functions and the CCPs. So I'm going to talk about each of the steps one by one. So the first step is to get the non-parametric estimate for the CCPs uh, for all the uh, combinations of X and J. X is the state and J is the option. So again, this is the uh, frequency estimator. So basically we count the number of times that uh, state X occurs in the data and the number of times that the, the combination of state X and action J occurs in the data. And so we divide the latter by the former that gives us the, uh, the uh, non-parametric estimate of the CCP, okay? Now the step, step two is uh, almost identical to how we estimate theta two that I already talked about, so basically, again, a frequency estimator. Uh, so this is actually the same um, as how we uh, estimate theta two uh, I talked about a few slides ago. So with these two, uh, the CCP and uh, uh, state transition probabilities estimated, we can actually proceed to the forward sim simulation step to approximate the choice specific value functions. So first, let's note that under the type one extreme value errors assumption, 
there is actually a nice close form relationship between the expected value of the epsilon term and the uh, conditional choice probability. Okay. Uh, so this is useful because you will actually use this uh, in the calculation of the single period utility. Okay. So now let's assume that we're going to uh, uh, approximate the choice specific value functions for this combination. The uh, action is J and the state is X. Okay. So we'll simulate S path. So within each path, uh, notice that here we already know the first period state and first period action, which is the state is X and the action is J. So then, because we have already non-parametrically recovered uh, or, or non-parametrically estimated the CCPs and the uh, state transition probabilities, so we can basically have a random draw. We can we can draw a next period state from the state transition probabilities. Right? And then given that next period state, we can have a random draw and, and, and draw a, an action from the conditional choice probabilities. So this process repeats for T periods. So T, capital T, this is the number of periods you are going to simulate. So T needs to be sufficiently large. Uh, what do we mean by sufficiently large? Uh, if the uh, this uh, gamma to the power, sorry, beta to a power of t is really small. This means that if we simulate for one more period, if we discount that period, the single period utility to the current period, that's going to be very small. So that means that t is sufficiently large. Okay. So this is how we compute the the uh, val choice specific value function for a particular uh, path, a realized path. And then we'll do this for S times, and then we will take the average. And that becomes our approximation of the choice specific value function for this combination of uh, action and state. Okay. So you can see that here we're not solving the dynamic program at all. So we're basically estimating CCPs and state transition probabilities from the data, and then use simulation to approximate the choice specific value functions. So once we have the choice specific value functions, uh, basically that choice specific value function goes into this, uh, this logic form, okay? So this, is, this must be familiar to you. Instead of having the deterministic part of the single period utility, we have the choice specific value function, okay? So this is the model predicted uh, conditional choice probabilities. And the final step is to find out the set of theta one that actually minimizes the uh, difference between or the distance between the uh, model predicted CCPs and the observed CCPs that we empirically recover from the data. Okay, so that's basically the uh, CCP estimator uh, for theta one. Now, the advantage of the uh, second approach is very clear. It's computationally efficient. However, we should know that the CCPs that we estimate from the data can only be used for the estimation. So for counterfactual simulations, we'll actually solve the uh, dynamic program again and find out the co corresponding CCPs. Okay, so this is very important uh, to remember. All right. So, um, that's basically about uh, yeah. That's basically about the uh, development and estimation of the uh, single agent dynamic choice models. So, uh, in the interest of time, I'll just quickly talk about how to estimate dynamic games at a very high level. And again, uh, if you have any questions, I'm happy to uh, discuss the details um, offline. So, uh, dynamic discrete games. Uh, by definition, individuals in the, uh, in, the, in the game are interacting with each other. So the notation I'm using here of, uh, primar uh, are primarily based on this Agriga Berry and Mira 2007 paper. So assume that we have n players in the game and the action is still binary. Um, you can think of this as whether the decision of whether to invest in technology or not. And we have observed state variable XIT. Um, you can think of as the uh, company's technology stock. Unobserved state variable epsilon IT. This is the a vector of private choice specific random shocks. Okay. So a player single period utility in the game setting is not only a function of their, uh, this individual's own state and own action, but also other players' states and actions. 
Okay, so that is why this uh, u sub i, this is a single peer utility for individual or player i, is a function of a sub t, x sub t, and epsilon i t. So a sub t is a stack of actions uh, by all the players in peer t, and x is a stack of states of all players in peer t. But notice that this private shock uh, only individual i's own private shock goes into uh, play individual i's utility function. Other players' private shock uh, do not directly go into the utility function. Okay. Now again, a, a rational player will be forward looking. They try to ma maximize their lifetime utility, which can be expressed like this. And this is the same set of assumptions as we made in the uh, single agent dynamic choice models. I'm not going to repeat those. Uh, I'd like to uh, talk about player strategies. So uh, here we assume that players are playing Markov strategies. Uh, this means that players' strategies are only a function of the current pure state and current pure random shock. Okay. So essentially, this, uh, this uh, strategy uh, here uh, we denote a strategy as uh, sigma is a mapping from the common, common knowledge state, uh, which is x, and the focal player's private shock, which is epsilon uh, i, to the action that the, the, the player will take. Okay. Again, uh, we need to uh, uh, get an estimate of the value function. So this is essentially you are uh, maximizing the, the, the lifetime value. Okay, so here you are choosing the actions that maximizes your uh, lifetime utility. And uh, I would like to get to this slide. So uh, this uh, equilibrium concept that's commonly used in the dynamic game setting is a Markov perfect equilibrium. So assume uh, uh, we define the best response function of player i, given that all other players are, are playing according to strategy sigma as this. Okay, this is the best response function for individual i, given that other players are playing strategy sigma. Now, a equilibrium strategy sigma star is basically the set of strategies that so such that for any i and any combination of state and private shock, uh, this function holds. As this is saying that if all other players are playing strategy sigma star, the best response of the first, uh, the focal player, player i, is also to play strategy star, uh, a strategy sigma star. Okay. That's the definition of the Markov perfect equilibrium. Okay. So sometimes it's more convenient to express the Markov perfect equilibrium in the probability space. So eventually what we're doing on this slide is to integrate out the individual uh, choice specific random shock epsilon i. So we do this on the uh, value function, choice specific value function, and the Bellman equation. Okay, we can also find a set of CCPs that correspond to any arbitrary strategy sigma so again, we're integrating out the epsilon, so we can calculate the uh, probability of taking a certain action conditional on the state, both the common knowledge state and the private state. Okay. Sorry, in this case, because the epsilon is integrated out, so this is basically the probability of taking a certain action conditional on the common knowledge state, x. Okay. So we can also express the best response mapping in the probability space in this way. Okay, so the uh, a Markov perfect equilibrium uh, can be represented in a probability space as a fixed point of this mapping. Okay. Now to estimate the model, we will make some further assumptions. Uh, the first one is that the common knowledge state, uh, states are observable and the private shocks are unobservable to uh, researchers. And also, we'll assume that the distribution of a private shock is given, is known. And also, data comes from a single equilibrium. Okay. So again, we partition the, uh, the whole entire set of parameter, parameters into theta 1 and theta 2. Theta 1 is the uh, set of parameters that go into the utility function, and theta 2 uh, is the set of parameters that govern the state transition probabilities. So the estimation of the theta two is similar uh, to how we estimate theta two in the uh, dynamic discrete choice, uh, single agent dynamic discrete choice models. And then here I'll just very briefly talk about how to estimate theta one, the utility parameters. 
So one straightforward way to estimate the utility parameters is now we can use sort of similar to the nested fixed point algorithm, for every trial value of theta one, we'll solve the dynamic gain for its equilibrium and calculate the likelihood. And eventually, the maximum likelihood estimator of theta one should maximize the, the likelihood that, that we, we see the observed uh, data. Now, uh, this is another way to implement the maximum likelihood estimator. So basically, uh, we have, this is called a pseudo likelihood function. This is a pseudo likelihood function because the P here is not necessarily the equilibrium uh, CCP. So here for any arbitrary P, we can have a pseudo maximum likelihood, uh, so, sorry, we can have a pseudo likelihood. And then, so the maximum likelihood estimator is basically the theta one that maximizes the pseudo likelihood subject to this condition. This is basically the equilibrium condition. So if a P satisfies this, that P is the equilibrium CCP, okay? So I guess I won't have time to talk about um, the exact implementation of the two estimators. One is the nested uh, pseudo likelihood estimator. The other is the BB, uh, BBL estimator. Uh, so um, they are both CCP based estimators and this one is a simulation based estimator. So I just want to quickly conclude. Uh, in this tutorial, uh, we actually present a set of uh, commonly used structural models. And we want to highlight that uh, structural models uh, rely on uh, economic theories to guide the model specification. And also we attempt to capture the underlying data generating process. Because the structural models capture the underlying data generating process, which is um, more likely to remain stable before and after a policy change, we can use these models to perform si policy simulations and generate counterfactuals. And, but we also need to be aware that uh, our models are only as good as our modeling assumptions. Therefore, we really need to ground the model construction on very sound theoretical foundations and also convincingly justify all the modeling assumptions we make. Okay, so with that, I'll conclude this talk and thank you very much for your attention.